Oh, it works. I don't know. I thought they were supposed to introduce me. So anyway. Hi, I'm Ira. I'm introduced now. Anyway, if you don't know who I am, look it up. There are lots of people who want to tell you the good as well as the horrible. So, you know, it's out there for you. So let's talk about the presentation because there's always a story to my presentations. This one, hacking closed networks. I was, one t I was watching TV, and how many people remember when the USS John McCain crashed in, in the South China Sea or whatever it was? So anyway, there are, let's see, does this working? Is this working? Is this working? It is not working. It's a closed network. Uh, to give me five minutes. Um, <laughs> Uh, hold on, let's see, is it turned on? There we go. There's the old thing, if something doesn't work, you know, you call up and they're like, is it plugged in? It's like, yes. Is it turned on? It's like, no. Anyway, so troubleshooting closed networks. So anyway, I was watching this and then like, you know, all the news stations, because this was like the seventh or eighth accident of a naval vessel, and they have all these talking head admirals on. And they're like, could this be a cyber attack? And they're like, oh no, that's a lot of things. These are closed networks. You can't get into them and all that stuff. And if you know me, well, first it was like, hold my bear. And if you know me, though, it's more like hold my diet Mountain Dew. So I was like, hold my diet Mountain Dew. And I'm like, I put a presentation together on how to do this because I've hacked closed networks before. And I'm like, give me five minutes. It's like, literally, it doesn't take that long to hack a closed network. So I just thought it's a bunch of hype. Now, the biggest problem is everybody's like out there, what, me, worry? It's like, no, it's a closed network, nothing to see here. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Because what's the biggest security? Let's see if I know my presentation well. Uh, let's see if I know my clicker well. Anyway, I did not turn it off, damn it. Um, ah, God, I hate this. Um, OK. Oh, it changed. Uh, so here's the biggest thing. Ignorance is dangerous. It's not bliss, especially when you're talking about cybersecurity. With cybersecurity and all that sort of stuff, you're sitting there, and the biggest thing you ever have, the most insecure networks. I was once sitting around at a CISO luncheon, and I was talking to some CISOs. I'm like, so, you know, one person was saying, it's like, yeah, we have some people who, like, you know, we had this stuff on our network, and then somebody else was talking about something. And then I go to the, and then this one guy says, yeah, we really don't have any problems. Like, really? Uh, it's like, yeah, we don't have any problems. I go, you know something? You're the most screwed person at this table. Because, you know, you're sitting there. It's like you don't have somebody losing a USB drive. You don't have somebody downloading a virus. You don't have somebody walking out without their, you know, like walking out with stuff and everything like that. If you don't know you have problems, you're screwed. So these people are generally screwed. And if you're sitting there thinking, because why do people close networks? because it's so valuable. Is it cheap to close a network? No. You have to have a separate architecture that's isolated from everything else. You have to install two sets of equipment just because you need a closed network equipment and an open network equipment and so on. But basically, if you... Okay, so anyway, if it's valuable enough to close, and this is the key point, if it's valuable enough to close, it's more than valuable enough for an attacker to figure out a way in. That's one of the key problems. You have to go ahead and know that if somebody is going to close it off, there's a reason it's closed off, and somebody's going to invest in trying to figure out how to get in, and that's a critical factor. So um, let's talk about, so I get, anybody here from my presentation in 2008 called How to Hack the Power Grid? Or How to Take It Down? Okay, a few of you. I'm going to give a little bit of snippet in that. So I gave a presentation in 2008 called How to Take Down the Power Grid where I basically went ahead and started talking about the vulnerabilities in the power grid and how I conducted a penetration test that really screwed things up for some people in theory. They had immediately after that, I had five federal agents contact me. Um, two of them showed up at my house unannounced. I had a lobbying group, the Edison Electric Institute. Some guy calls me up and goes, oh, we heard about your presentation, and we'd love to you come in and talk to you. I'm like, OK, that's it. It's like, yeah, maybe we'll have a speaking engagement or something like that. It's not like we're trying to discredit you or anything. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like that's kind of like the sub, uh, uh, what do you call it, a Freudian slip type of thing. Because if somebody says they're not trying to discredit you out of the blue, they're trying to discredit you out of the blue. That's a given. 
So anyway, lo and behold, I thought that was it. I had some like people from the nuclear regulatory you know, call me. Oh, we'd like you to talk to you about your presentation. So I invited them to my house. So anyway, I walked them through how I, you know, the presentation. They're like, well, we want more information. I go, you're not getting more information. And anyway, they left. They were kind of nice. And then I got another, and then I got a call from somebody at Pacific Northwest Labs, and they're like, well, my boss told me he's interested in your presentation, he's, and then they asked some more questions. I'm like, I'm not telling you anything. And then he's like, well, you know, people are really, I go, I don't care. Then I got a call from the deputy director at Pacific Northwest Labs, and the guy goes, oh, hi, I'm the deputy director. I used to be, a spe I used to be an assistant director of the FBI. I go, I really don't care. And then they're like, oh, I want more information. So I told them I'm not giving you anything. Then he friended me on LinkedIn and all that stuff. And then like a couple weeks later, then I get a call from the guy who claims to be the director of security or the deputy director at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And he calls me up and basically asks me the same questions that everybody else was asking me. I'm like, and then I'm like entertaining a guy. I go, here's the thing, I'm kind of busy, but at the end of the day, I don't know who the hell, I, was, I don't know who the F you actually are. You're just a voice on a telephone. And even if you were, I'm not telling you. So anyway, he's like, well, there might be congressional hearings. I'm like, I don't care. It's more free publicity for me. Go ahead. So anyway, then there was that. And they were working so hard to do this. And then I had the two, ag two FBI agents come in, and I'm like, you're, by the way, quick thing, even if you're completely innocent, never talk to law enforcement, and I work with law enforcement, no benefit to talking to law enforcement. Freak, you know, if you get nothing out of that. So I'm like, I'm not gonna talk to them, but I'm gonna yell at them. So I invited them in, and I, let my, and I had a husky who's really friendly, and he was a big husky, and I sat them down, and my husky thinks any person who might come in the house might feed them. And so he goes ahead and he sits there. And then my husky just is like looking at this one guy, like literally right there. And it, the, bear, the worst part is he would do this and he would never lick you. He just kept his muzzle there right in your face. And I'm like, and I'm like, I just, oh, just ignore him. He'll go away. But anyway, then I had these FBI agents and I'm like, I'm not telling you, you know, after a half hour of yelling at them. And then they left. And then what else happened? Uh, that's pretty much, oh yeah, then I got a call from Brian Krebs. And Brian Krebs said, Ira, I got a call from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they want to tell me, they want to, you, they want to tell me why your presentation is complete BS. And I was like, and he goes, that's how I know it's true. He's like, they were volunteering stuff. So anyway, after I gave this presentation and everybody was trying to discredit me, two months later, Brian Krebs had to write an article because the, the government accounting office put out a report that the Tennessee Valley Authority had their business networks overlapping with their control networks, which was the essence of my presentation at RSA. So anyway, I'm not saying my case study was a new t um, TVA. I can't tell you which ones for a variety of reasons, but this was out there in the public two months later after they were trying to discredit everything I said in theory. So next... Um, This is really annoying. Anyway, uh, I'm going to walk over there, then it will change. Um, <laughs> OK, so how to hack a closed network. The ways are almost infinite. I mean, frankly, hacking closed networks is literally limited by your creativity. There are so many different ways to do it. There's many different scenarios and all that stuff. Most of the time, then the closed networks aren't really closed, and that's a key point. Then even if they are closed networks, access control points are usually widely available. And then there's diagnostic equipment. People have like, so for example, power, like people who, like line operators, people who fix power grids and stuff like that. Basically, they have laptop computers that they plug into the, the system. And of course, these line operators never use their computers for anything they're not supposed to, all the hundreds of thousands of them out there. And then you have insider abuse and compromising the developers, and I'm going to talk about most of these quickly. Okay, so first off, let's talk about something that came out a couple weeks ago. There was a CERT advisory that said Russia is targeting the ICS system through multiple stage campaigns. It's watering hole attacks. Watering hole attacks are essentially, you know where people from that organization will go to on the internet on a regular basis, and you will hack that website and put malware, and then once the malware's there, it downloads the malware onto the network. And that's a critical thing that most people 
But that was one. Then there was phishing. Sometimes they try to fish credentials. Sometimes they try to get malware on there. And then there's an awful lot of open, and they also said they're looking at open source information. Because even on these supposedly closed ICS critical networks, there's terabytes worth of data out there on how these networks are configured, what to do about them, where to plug into them, what their equipment is, vulnerabilities, and so on. Click, click, click. Arr. Okay, let me walk over here. Okay, there we go. And here's another thing. Most of the time, closed networks usually aren't closed. They might have started out closed, and that's a critical thing, because everybody wants it. But then after a while, everybody's like, oh, well, it's kind of annoying that it's closed. I just need this one thing added to it. I just need access to one thing. They're like, okay, we'll give you the one thing. And then that one thing turns into two things and so on. You know, sometimes, and, and the thing is, periodically, you have the closed network, so they add some functionality to it, then because they don't want the expense. Well, I don't want to give you two computers to access it simultaneously and so on. Then they put in the limited connections and then they br add bridges and then all of a sudden the closed networks become open networks. Now here's how the migration tends to come out. Let's say you have a closed network like an ICS network or something and you have the operator sitting there and stuff like that. Then they're like, okay, they need to check their email and they don't want the person to get up and go somewhere else. So they put a system on there that's connected to the intranet and then they have two computers that they have to sit at. And that becomes really annoying and inconvenient and so on. Then somebody says, we are spending all this money on multiple computers and that really is bad. And so they say, well, Let's just give them direct access because the intranet's closed off itself, so we're not going to do it. And then at some point, they go ahead, create this environment, and somebody's like, hey, our employees need internet access or something like that. So let's add internet access. And all of a sudden, that network that began is closed, that then was just there, added functionality for limited capability. All of a sudden, that became an internet access point. And that's how a lot of closed networks become open really, really. It's kind of like it just seeps in over time. Next, uh, okay, so let's talk about power capacity sales because ICS systems, especially like, for example, um, power systems and so on, like to buy electricity where, you know, power company in like New York might have over, you know, too much electricity and somebody in Idaho needs some more electricity. So they go ahead and they have systems on the internet that allow people to log in and say, hey, I want to buy some extra power from you or I have extra power from you. So what they have to do is they're plugged into the internet and then once they're plugged into the internet, in order to see the power, how much capacity there is, what systems there are on the internet and so on, that has to be plugged into actual production systems that know what's going on. So this is a critical way, for just for example, how you have some connections on the internet that you would not think are actually there on the internet. Previously, they had to dial in and all that stuff, but everything has to be online to hand, happen at light speed and so on. Okay, so even worse. I'm, not, I'm just talking about the obvious things that happen. It doesn't include wireless systems, where all of a sudden you put in a wireless router someplace because everybody has to have access to their cell phones and that becomes an issue. Then you have the whole concept of rogue IT, which a lot of people don't talk about, where people buy their own computers or maybe they're even company computers, but they start plugging them into the network. And then they have, I had one guy, so I used to work for a large company. I worked for several, so I can't identify which. But there was one guy who decided, he worked in an office, and he thought he needed better connectivity because he didn't want to have to go through the corporate VPN or whatever it was. So he went ahead and had a, an internet connection installed into his office. You know, and somebody called up, and then they were all of a sudden like, Ira, do you know he ordered a, a new line? And my reaction was along the lines of, what was the expression, not my circus, not my monkeys? Um, that was pretty much what happened. Some people out there just decide they need another internet connection because they want a faster connection and they order it and that happens too. Then you have your subcontractors because subcontractors usually have to connect into your networks to do things like, for example, the Target hack. Target, and I'm not saying Target was a closed network, which it wasn't, but Target had their business network and Target had their vendor network. And the way the major Target hack was compromised was because somebody hacked into the 
target vendor network, and then they found a way to tunnel into the target business network because the two networks were, even though it was a small interconnection, they were interconnected and allowed access to it. And again, there's just so many different ways these closed networks somehow maintain you know, something like access to the outside world. So once in, and here's the critical thing, when you have a closed system, do you, do you think security patches get uploaded on a frequent basis? No. Everybody's like, oh, that's a closed system. I have to take it. I have to download it. I have to plug it in on USB drives. And sometimes it's too big for that. I have to go ahead and do all my uploads. And so they never patch the system. So for example, one of the latest systems was the WannaCry, or what latest incident was the WannaCry virus. All what happened was they're like, well, we have these MRI machines. And these MRI machines are all on old Windows computers. And we don't we can't update them because it's like old MRI software, and if we do that, that'll really screw things up. So all of a sudden, the WannaCry virus was spreading throughout all these things that were supposedly closed networks that they thought would never have connectivity because nobody tested it out, and the WannaCry virus pretty much was worm-like and started finding other systems throughout the networks, and that was critical. So the systems are outdated, both in configuration and hardware and software, which leaves them vulnerable to attacks, and that's another thing. So once they're in, the networks are usually wide open for anybody. Um, Click. <laughs> Do you guys have another clicker with a good, better battery? Hold on, maybe I'll take the battery out and put the battery in. Uh, sometimes that works. Gives it fresh life. There we go. Okay, so next is how APTs compromise. So, for example, if you have something like China, now, everybody's like, China, China, China. No, it's like, it, they really do stuff. Yes, China does hack things. So the way APTs typically hack it, one thing is, and I, I have different presentations about APT called Advanced Persistent Threat. Frankly, I don't like that name. I like to call them Adaptive Persistent Threat because the type of attacks they do aren't really quote unquote advanced. They're basic attacks, but the organization might be considered advanced. So what APTs do is they have a really well-established methodology. So anyway, they start out with a breach team. The breach team's job is just to break into the organization. They have a bunch of specialized people. I should say there's also a collection management team. The collection management team does tasking. So that's a separate issue, but let's assume they're already tasked. But you start out with a breach team to go in and target it. The way they'll do it typically is they'll send out phishing messages, they'll scan networks, they'll go through LinkedIn, they'll do whatever it takes to find a potentially vulnerable point on the network. So for example, we're here at RSA, uh, I don't know how many people remember when RSA was compromised and the secure ID software was stolen. That all happened because a breach team, supposedly China's breach team, went ahead and targeted. They went through LinkedIn, found out who RSA used for um, like online, getting online resumes. I think it was Munster.com. What they then did was once they found that, they said who inside RSA is responsible for looking at resumes, and then they create a crafted phishing message and said, here's your latest upload of potential resumes. And the message ironically went to a spam filter, but the person decided to look into it, and they opened it up, and because it was a specialized attack methodology, oh, what'd you give me? Okay, so because it was a specialized attack, they went ahead and got in and, um, and started implement and downloaded software onto the network, and that happened really quick. So anyway, the breach team gets a target employee, they get a foot, foothold on the system. Can you change the slide while you're there? Okay, thank you. And then once they have that system there, the next thing they do is they, find, they hack a bunch of other systems. Some of them are staging servers, and they go ahead and use those systems to actually launch attacks against other, net, other systems throughout the network. Thank you. And once they have the attacks against other systems, the next thing they also do is try to identify what's known as exfiltration servers. Those are servers that essentially sit there, and they don't hack anything. They're just where all the data goes to. So that's another step. Then... Then what happens, the breach team says, we have accomplished our mission. Then they go to the collection team. The collection team has a different set of specialists. They have everything there. Now their goal is to find new at the, the data that they're looking for. And generally, they look for lots and lots of data. 
So then the breach team goes on to another target. They go ahead and pretty much back out. And now the collection team usually works directly against the staging servers. They use the staging servers to start hacking everything throughout the organization. They start finding the data that they want to collect. Once they collect the data, they, find, they send it to the exfiltration servers. And the data is stored there for a period of time until at some point in time they think they got enough data. And then they go ahead and send it out to the data receivers, which are scattered throughout the internet. And when you hear people like at the FBI and comes to you and says, um, you might have a problem. There's some malformed DNS traffic um, coming out of your network. And you're like, can you help me? They go, no, we can't. And then it's like, OK, what? And then I, I get a call. And they're like, Ira, the FBI said we have malformed DNS traffic. What does that mean? I go, I go it means you're screwed. So this is kind of what that means. Because what they want to do is these Chinese people do not want to go ahead and basically let you know that they're there. So they store de collected data on internal systems and then send it out in one massive, you know, usually one massive download, like as a video stream or something else to get it out of there. So that's how they generally work. So let's talk about the power grid that got me five federal agents. Let's see if I could go for six this time. So what happened was, um, so we went ahead and like they said, Ira, we want you to kind of figure out a way into like this power company. And they're like, I'm like, um, what can I do? They're like, they don't think you could do anything. You, I go, I can do it. They're like, they don't think you can do anything. So you have no limitations. I'm like, really? They're like, yeah, really? I'm like, cool. So what happened was, I'm like, what type of data do I have? So I had a user list for like a special interest group that people belong to inside the company who worked on critical systems. So what happened was, got the user group list, and then we went ahead and created a web server that we were going to put malware on and return a 404 error type of thing. So then I put together an inflammatory message from, you know, inflammatory HR related message, and I sent it out to really just a small targeted group of people. And so the message went out to a small targeted group of people. They went ahead, got the web request, and the web request returned the malware and all that sort of stuff. And then at the end of the day, that gave system control. The thing was, this attack had to be stopped really, really quickly within a couple hours because everybody's like, can you believe what they're doing? And people would forward, there was like a 17,000% return on click-through rate on my phishing messages <laughs> because people were sending it out. Be, you know, they're like, can you believe they're doing this? And it kept going out and out and out. They're like, I, I, then they're like, we had to stop it. I go, well, you told me there were no limitations. They're like, well, we made a mistake. So anyway. <laughs> So that was my case study in 2008. I told you what happened with the you know, Tennessee Valley Authority you know, two months later. Then Siobhan Gorman reported that Russia and China were hacking the US power grids um, back in 2009. She had a major story out at that point. You know, she used to be with the Wall Street Journal, and now she's working some crisis PR firm. And then all of a sudden, Wired reported, you know, like last year, that Russia and China are hacking the US power grid. Wow, that's new and revolutionary. It's like, no, nah, that's kind of like eight years old. But anyway, that's irrelevant. But then a new round of hacks were new. So that came out in 2018. Then we're probably going to have, um, it's just my prediction that in six months more, we're going to hear more hacks against the power grid that nobody ever conceived of before and everything like that. And by the way, Russia did hack the Ukrainian power grid in 2017. Now, now we're talking uncontrolled access points. Closed networks frequently have many, many access points. So for example, the power grid, every place there is, it's like linemen can plug into stuff. Smart meters in your house are really great for plugging stuff in and all that stuff. Then there's power, you know, there's different sort of power stations and everything where you can plug things into all the time. And that's like a hacker's dream and stuff if they actually have the nerve to do something like that. There's the critical infrastructure, also like water lines. Just imagine all the water lines, all the control valves and everything. Everything these days is controlled by computers. And if something's a computer, a computer can be hacked. You know, the air traffic control systems, you know, everybody thinks it's like, oh, we're just talking about this. No, the air traffic control system is a major, major thing. How many people remember the movie War Games? Now they're going to redo it and ruin it. But the movie War Games came out in like 1984, probably was written in 1982. In 1982, the thing was some kid got a war dialer and, hacked and found a way in and stuff like that. I think it was in like 1997, some kid got a war dialer and all of a sudden took down at Worcester, Massachusetts, Airport 
Lord because he hacked in and took down the control tower, which no longer could control the landing lights and the transmitter and all that sort of stuff. And just imagine, that's one single airport. What about all the other radar indicators that's all over the place, light landing lights that come in for miles ahead and all that sort of stuff? So think about that. Water system, telecom systems have access points all over the place. I mean, even when you walk around here, not that I'm telling you to hack the Moscone Center, but they have wiring closets that could probably be used for certain things, and I'm not going to tell you what. So then you have the Marucci incident. The Marucci incident, as it's known, that most people probably heard of but haven't heard of, is some guy in Australia got really pissed off. And what happened was he worked for a SCADA, you know, he worked for a company installing SCADA equipment on the sewage system of the Marucci district in Australia. And he left under bad circumstances, and then he went and stole some control equipment. And then he just drove around. He didn't need access. It was radio-controlled equipment. And he started leaking hundreds of thousands of gallons of sewage into open waterways because he was kind of pissed off. So that was the Marucci incident of somebody hacking a closed network because he just stole some basic equipment. So next, if we're talking especially about naval vessels, airplanes, a whole bunch of other stuff, there's diagnostic equipment. Because let's say the system is completely closed off. You need diagnostic equipment to make sure everything is working properly. You need to calibrate. You know, for example, radar. Radar needs to be calibrated on a periodic basis. You need specialty diagnostic equipment. How many people are controlling that diagnostic equipment in a safe that is only going to be handled through trusted mechanisms? Very few. And these things can be special equipment. They could be PCs. They might be USB drives. Again, they get plugged in through one way or another on ships, on airplanes. Everywhere there's critical devices, you have diagnostic equipment plugged in. And for the naval vessels, can you hack it? Think about this. US naval vessels go all over the world. They have major ports in a lot of countries and a lot of different areas. And can you trust everybody that comes in any vicinity of diagnostic equipment? And if you've ever worked with the military, you know, you're not just talking about the military itself, which even if you think they are paragons of virtue, you're talking about local contractors who have to come on, take the trash off. You're talking about cleaning people that come on. And if you can guarantee the tens of thousands of people are all pristine people who are trusted with, with the safety of the steering systems on naval vessels, I got a few bridges to sell you in New York City. So anyway, but not everybody's cleared and the diagnostic equipment might not be treated as, you know, as securely as it should be. So next, some hacks require detailed research because is it possible in theory to get malware on a naval vessel? Yes. How hard is it to make it useful? It's really, really hard. I'm not saying this is a trivial thing to do. You need to understand the architecture of, like, for example, what is the closed network of a naval vessel look like? What is the command information center, or the CIC, I forgot what that means, command intelligence center, or whatever that is, um, on a ship and all these closed networks? You need to do a lot of research. You know, where can you get the research, though? Well, perhaps you can, con you can hack into Northrop Grumman, um, Lockheed Martin, and all these other people who would never be hacked because they're defense contractors, you know, and then find all that data. And then you could also go out, these, you know, go out for RFPs that the Navy put out. You can go out, look at diagnostic equipment that's sent all over the world in all these ports that people go to. And you can learn the architecture because somebody said, well, how can you shut off a naval, you know, like the navigation system? It's like, well, that might require autonomous software. And for the autonomous software to work, much like Stuxnet, for example, and actually I should talk about Stuxnet before I go into all these hypotheses, because Stuxnet is real. But just for the naval vessels, if you know what systems connect the architecture of those systems, you could potentially issue kill commands at different points in time. But for example, with Stuxnet, Stuxnet, um, like, Supposedly, the U.S. government and Israeli intelligence found out what the architecture looked like in this Iranian facility, an underground facility. They found out who's delivering equipment down there and so on. And they went ahead and did all that research to figure out what should the Stuxnet architecture look like, what are all the zero-day vulnerabilities they're going to embed with it, what's the core technology they're going to try to exploit, and so on. But there's lots of ways to get that. And then, of course, nobody would hack U.S. contractors except for all the people who have. And um, there was the case of um, Sue Bin. How many people heard of Sue Bin? It surprises me. When I was doing research, I'm like, I can't believe nobody heard of this guy. But Su Bin ran a hacking group for China based in the U.S. He was a Canadian citizen, supposedly. 
And between 2008 and 2014, his group hacked 50 terabytes of defense-related data that was then shipped to China. And for his efforts, he got five years in jail. My, that was worth it. So anyway, but then BAE Systems, a British company, they were hacked in 2009. Lockheed Martin had hacked in 2011. You know, an Australian contractor who actually has a whole bunch of data on systems the US, Australia, Brit, you know, Britain and a whole bunch of other people use. They compromise 30 gigabytes worth of data on things including smart bombs and stuff. And if you can hack it out, here's the other point. If you want to hack a network, how many people think if you can hack it, nobody would ever think of trying to manipulate the data that's there? Because if you think nobody, if you can get it out and you don't think somebody's trying to put stuff in, you're kind of delusional. So you got to think, not only are people trying to get it out, they're trying to put stuff in. Because, and the problem is, even if nobody has done that, it is 100% completely possible to do it. And that's the bigger threat. And people have done that. Then also compromise the supply chain. And everybody's like, wow, who could do all that? Um, how many people heard of the equation group? Okay, the equation group might supposedly be the NSA Tailored Access Office, NSA Tau. And the NSA Tau, they went ahead and they supposedly put malware on the systems that people didn't even know exist. Even when you know that malware's there, you can't find it to get it off. And some of the ways they did that was they went ahead and intercepted, for example, electronic equipment, computers, and everything else going to Russia, China, people they wanted to break into, and all that sort of stuff. And they compromised the equipment, and they put malware into it, embedded it in the hardware, and shipped it out. So that, the equation group, is already done. And that's the US. Likewise, supposedly, I'll get, well, actually, I'll come to that in another slide. China was accused of doing it. And Stuxnet, that's a big thing. An actual example of that being done, because everybody said, oh, they dropped USB drives. It's like, nah, they didn't drop USB drives. They actually compromised the equipment being delivered to Iranian, contra Iranian nuclear contractors before it got shipped to the underground facility. And that's how not only did it get in, Every time they got new equipment, the new equipment kept having updated versions of Stuxnet. Because Stuxnet kept having, what was the name of the documentary about Stuxnet? Um, Zero Day? Yeah, so Zero Day was a great documentary. So watch that to find out. I don't know if Zero Day spoke about the compromise of the supply chain, but either way, they kept getting lots of updates. Then also, let's assume you have ships in the water. Let's assume you have people working at NSA or power companies or the power grid or whatever. Insiders are there. Some insiders I've heard don't like where they work and are kind of pissed off about that. And so some insiders have caused damage. How many people heard about people like IT people inside organizations that said, if my name is not on the payroll, wipe out the whole payroll? That has happened. There are documented cases of admins and developers putting time bombs in the software. And if you think p admins and developers who do this, who are random people just with one act of maliciousness can do it, do you think foreign intelligence agencies would not think of doing this themselves? I mean, I'm talking about the equation group that started all these really advanced hacks in the early 2000s. I, you can kind of expect that Russia, China, Iran, Israel, and a whole bunch of other people have caught up on these technologies by now. So anyway, they stop you know, taking little things out and whatever. So then there's also black bag operations. Black bag operations are a lot of, I mean, that's essentially what, you know, some of the people might know of my espionage simulations where I've gone in, stole nuclear reactor designs, taken over banks and stuff like that, where I would go into a facility, and this is actually a true story. So one time, I'm going to tell this. No, I was going to tell this story on Thursday, so I'm not going to tell this one. I'll tell another one. Um, so there was one time where I was supposed to go into a facility. It's a Fortune 5 company. Their main research and development, lots of manufacturing, because Fortune Global 5 companies manufacture stuff. So I went into their main network headquarters. And the way we got into main network headquarters were we were basically, you know, the guard shack, like there was like a facility and they had guards that were stationed to only let people who with badges on. But morning rush hour, they were just like this, you know, don't worry about it. Then we went to their computer operations center, and the computer operations center, obviously you needed badges to get in, but there was no guard. There was a guard desk on the far left or whatever, but everybody would walk in the front door, and they would just keep walking, and then there was the door where you needed to like swipe your badge to open it up and unlock, so me and my accomplices just kept walking with them, so then we were there. Then we had to find the network operations center. 
Network Operations Center in the basement. Where else are they going to be? So just in case the sprinklers went off, they could get flooded and destroyed. So they were nice there in the, in the basement. So then we were waiting for somebody to enter a crypto lock. So they had a crypto lock, and we didn't have it. And if you've ever tried to do a penetration test, you always look around on picture frames and other places where the number is because they don't want to go ahead and have that. But we looked around, and there was no number to be found. So I'm like, they were like, what are you going to do? I'm like, just give me a few minutes. They're like, what are you going to do? I'm like, just let me sit here. And I just started tapping the buttons, like just waiting like this. And then at some point in time, somebody opened the door to exit the network operations center. I was like, thanks. And I went in with my accomplices. And we found all of a sudden all their critical systems, the primary domain controllers, their database servers, and everything like that. The screens were just left on with the control, with the keyboards and everything. So we just added new users to the network. And we could have pretty much manipulated all the equipment they were like we could have added malware to the network and that actually got their corporate security budget up by 15 million dollars the following week because they thought we could have embedded malware into systems they were delivering all over the world so that happened and that's easy but you know black bag operations in the real world they're specialists they might you know there's a small group of people everybody thinks that's the James Bond type small small group of people from N you know the CIA that might do stuff like that usually there aren't you know like special forces people who are trained to do stuff but anyway usually it's a last resort because you'd rather have an insider do it because if you have somebody in a hostile facility caught the worst thing that happens ever to an intelligence operation is you get caught and you don't want your people actually sitting there getting caught but it can happen but something of last resort Next, making closed networks open networks. I don't know about you, but I've been in facilities where they have their open network and they have their closed network and they have wiring closets. And I sat there and they're like, okay, this is our network that's handling all this, you know, like sensitive stuff. And this is the rack of equipment that's handling all of the non-sensitive open stuff. I'm like, what happens if I take a cable from that network to that network? They're like, oh, nobody would ever do that. I'm like, give me a minute. And they went ahead and do it. Then there was other times we were breaking into organizations and we broke into an organization and they wanted us to compromise the network and we were like, oh, it's closed and everything. So what I did was we, we took a basic box, you know, like a telecom router and stuff like that. We plugged a cell phone into it and then we went up to their facility, like, the net, the, like this research area that was supposedly just a closed network for the research people and you know pretty much got into the facility you know through a variety of you know easy way just like um what do you call it um tailgating people in went upstairs required elevator card key to get in just follow people up they they got off on the right floor and then i went in and the door had another lock and we didn't have the key there just bang on the door and kept banging and then finally some guy comes over and he's like this guy in a like lab coat he comes over he opens up the door it's like one of these where he opens the door and then goes running back to his desk he didn't even give us a second look I'm like, thank you. So anyway, then we went ahead, we found the router, and then we just plugged our little box into the router on the network with the cell phone. We plugged the cell phone and the other, the router thing into their power system and just left it sit there. And it was open for at least three months because we obviously compromised everything. And then they went back to retrieve it three months later. They're like, here's your equipment. I'm like, thanks so much. I'm like, can we just see how long it goes? They're like, no. So that was pretty much it. But think about it this way. Likewise, the Marucci systems. It's easy to just plug things in. The Marucci thing, again, you can attach a router to it and just have a more permanent hack of systems and so on. And modems, they still do exist. So Stuxnet's basics, I kind of already you know, walked through it, but basically somebody went ahead and figured out what is the architecture, what's the software hardware that happened inside that underground Iranian plant. They went ahead and figured out how was the architecture getting there. They found the subcontractors that the people were using. They developed hacks specific to the SCADA software that was being used on these systems that controlled the centrifuges, and then they just let it go. And then they updated it. Now, the way they theoretically got it in, people were reporting they left USB drives around where people would pick it up. And then later it was reported that somebody basically compromised the supply chain and delivered them, you know, kept delivering new equipment that was already had malware implanted through the supply chain. And the critical thing where everybody's talking about hacking naval vessels, the, the hack on Stuxnet was autonomous. In other words, it just went automatically. They just hoped and prayed it would work, and they were right. It worked until it worked too well and got out, and that was, that's when it became a problem. So can you hack a naval vessel? Yes. 
it, it, you can easily hack, I, I shouldn't say easily, it's theoretically possible to hack a naval vessel. Stuxnet-like activity strategy, again, it's been done with Stuxnet and that was a long time ago. You can do it, again, hacking defense contractors, have them install malware inside defense contractors, let them ship out stuff when they do updates to a whole bunch of other stuff, determine the vectors, and pretty much that, I'm, I don't want to rehash the whole presentation. So let's do a disclaimer. First off, the attack I just mentioned, all these attacks, well, the ones I mentioned are real, are real. I've never hacked a naval vessel. Nobody's ever paid me to do it, so I'm not going to you know, until they pay me. But then the similar attacks have been accomplished by, by Stuxnet, by the Marucci incident, by dozens of other things, people planting time bombs, and so on. It's all possible. I should say, after my 2008 attack, CBS News reported that Al-Qaeda was using my presentation as a training aid for their terrorists. I was kind of honored. <laughs> But then it's like, I'm like thinking, if that's them, I'm kind of happy because I did not give enough information how to really hack the power grid. So again, if somebody wants to go ahead and hack a naval vessel with just what I said, have a party because they're going to be wasting a lot of time trying to figure it out because there is some misinformation in here. So with that being said, um, oh yeah, by the way, open networks, pretty much the same thing. Now, how to secure these things? The first thing is you have to acknowledge the risk exists. And in these cases, people rely too much on protection. The way Snowden was able to theoretically be successful was NSA said, we have a closed network. We trust all our insiders. So we're going to go ahead and protect, and we don't need to protect things as well. But they didn't have detection in place. So if you have a closed network and you're relying upon all your people being good, you better have good detection strategies. And that's another presentation. But again, protection needs to be as tight as the most valuable network as well, because think about this. Again, the critical point is if that if something is valuable enough to put it on a closed network, the bad guys are going to go ahead and try to figure out a way in. So you better increase protection beyond just closing the network, and you better also increase detection and your reaction capability, because somebody's eventually going to get in. Because the biggest thing I have, you know how you can always tell somebody's a fool or a liar when they promise perfect protection. If somebody ever says there's perfect protection, they're a fool or a liar, and that's a given. The big takeaway, it can be done. Such attacks are not impossible. RSA wants to apply slides. So basically, determine if you have closed networks, and then see if they're really closed you know, quickly as possible, and then you really need to go ahead and do a real assessment of your architecture to see if it is closed, how can people get in, and then simultaneously perform the assessment, because it will take a few months to plan it, and in six months, hopefully, you can be able to run it and see what's there, and likewise for open networks. Everybody buy my book, it's awesome. I'm doing a book signing on Thursday, but buy it in advance, because, you know, nobody ever comes to my book signings. And then, um, anyway, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Okay, have a lovely day. Thanks. Thanks.